The Christmas Truce of 1914, perhaps one of the most heartwarming stories of one of the bloodiest wars in history. Most of the powers engaged in fighting at the time the war started were convinced the war would only last a few months at the most, but as we all know, that was as wrong as it was possible to be. The Christmas Truce was perhaps the first act into World War I where frontline fighters began to grow tired of the endless, fruitless assaults on their enemies, perhaps to only really gain a few yards of ground. The losses were mounting up, and the soldiers began to defy direct orders not to fraternize with the enemy. The first mention of a Christmas truce between the warring armies happened a few weeks before Christmas Day 1914. Pope Benedict XV suggested the sides lay down their arms and cease fire on one another for the day and allow the soldiers to celebrate the holiday. He asked that the guns may fall silent at least upon the night the angels sang. All of the nation's high commands refused to agree to any ceasefire or truce and vowed to continue fighting regardless. Soldiers in the trenches were there fighting a war that they'd been told by their superiors would have already been over by this point. Living in completely inadequate conditions, close to freezing each night as winter drew in, I'm sure you can understand why the soldiers began to soften to the enemy they were facing in the hope that they might do the same. They were taking orders from generals who sat far behind the lines, not engaged in the fighting. And it's that distance perhaps that allowed the first stages of fraternization to actually begin. Communication took time to travel between officers on the front lines and the generals back at headquarters, so certain things could go on that they wouldn't find out about. Besides that first mention from Pope Benedict that a Christmas truce could actually become a reality, there had already been a few small-scale truces conducted along the front lines between the British and French on one side and the Germans on the other. From around November 1914 onwards, as the two sides really settled in to that stalemate of trench warfare, there was said to be a ceasefire after sunset at certain points along the line when soldiers would have their rations brought out to them. It may not even have been a spoken agreement between the two sides, but the events of peace after sunset were well documented in soldiers' diaries. Similar ceasefires were conducted to allow medical soldiers to set out into no man's land and collect bodies of fallen soldiers so they could be brought back behind the lines for burial and even occasionally they would rescue soldiers who might still have been alive out there in no man's land. As time drew on, the live and let live mentality was more frequently observed on some sections of the line, and in other sections there was just no relent in the fighting at all. It really depended on where you were and who you were with in the trenches at the time as to whether these unspoken and unofficial truces ever occurred. Something that stimulated these meetings and truces even further was the extremely close proximity of the two front lines. In some places, the trenches were only about 30 or 40 yards apart from each other, and that made it very easy for soldiers to shout over the top at the other trench, whose people would usually reply. According to many soldiers recounting their experiences, many of these conversations were held in English, with a few of the German soldiers translating for the rest. Many German soldiers had lived in London before the war began and had a good understanding of the English language. Questions about the football scores in the English league, the weather in London, and even attempts at jokes were made between the lines. As the days and nights grew closer to Christmas, songs and hymns would break out in one trench and would either be joined in or replied back to with another song by the other trench. Now these fraternization events were obviously caught wind of by the higher command of both the British and German empires. The live and let live mentality I mentioned earlier was widely discouraged by the British command 
and direct orders were given for soldiers not to engage the enemy at any stage unless it was to attack them. This mentality of reduced attack was hard to turn around once it had started and the British command were hard set on making sure their soldiers remained focused. The great beauty here though is again because of the distance between the front line, the generals at headquarters and the politicians running the British Empire back in the United Kingdom, this word could almost be disregarded by the soldiers. Those in power had no direct route to quickly discipline soldiers caught disobeying orders and young officers in the trenches as well did little to discourage them from talking to the enemy. On Christmas Eve 1914, the first large-scale truce between the two warring sides began. German soldiers along the front lines in the region of Ypres lit candles in the trenches and sang Christmas carols together. The British lines responded with their own carols and within hours, troops had come out of the trenches into no man's land to greet one another. At first, these meetings were fairly short and merely, as in previous weeks, were to arrange the collection of dead bodies for burial. But as the night grew on, the meetings changed from those of reclamation to celebration. Onwards into Christmas Day, and over 100,000 men of both British and German allegiance lay down their arms in an unofficial ceasefire. This didn't extend all the way along the line, but merely in sections. Sections clearly populated by men who'd grown tired of the endless fighting for no real gain. During the day, German and British soldiers exchanged gifts and rations, ranging from cigarettes and alcohol such as whiskey to cheese and chocolate. Bruce Bairn's father, a soldier of the British Empire during the war, but after became a famous cartoonist, said this of the Christmas truce. I wouldn't have missed that unique and weird Christmas day for anything. I spotted a German soldier, some sort of lieutenant I should think, and being a bit of a collector, I intimated to him that I'd taken a fancy to some of his buttons. I brought out my wire clippers and with a few deft snips, removed a couple of his buttons and put them in my pocket. I then gave him two of mine in exchange. The last I saw was one of my machine gunners, who was a bit of an amateur hairdresser in civil life, cutting the unnaturally long hair of a docile bock, who was patiently kneeling on the ground whilst the automatic clippers crept up the back of his neck. And then of course there was the famous football match. Depicted here in a Christmas advert in 2014, the British and German troops battled it out in no man's land not to kill each other, but to win a game of football. According to German Lieutenant Kurt Zemisch, a British soldier kicked a football out of their trench and onto the frozen ground beyond, and pretty soon, a game started. Now, there have been over 25 different accounts of football matches taking place on the front on Christmas Day, but none of them have any substantial story behind them to really give a full account. Pictures do show that they happened, but it will never truly be known what happened in those matches. Beyond Christmas Day along the lines, the mood in the trenches remained festive, and some parts did not resume fighting until way past Boxing Day. Further meetings in No Man's Land did take place, this time in the snow that fell the day after. There are some reports of battles not recommencing until New Year's Day, but in general, the further from Christmas Day that the soldiers lived, the less and less festive spirit remained, and fighting ended up resuming. It's really important to remember that it's estimated only a small fraction of soldiers on those famous days in 1914 actually engaged in a Christmas truce. The majority of the line held firm, and fighting remained strong throughout the Christmas period. One account from Alfred Anderson, a former Scottish veteran of the war, gives us perhaps one of the few reports that on Christmas morning, silence fell over the Western Front. I remember the silence, the eerie sound of silence. Only the guards were on duty. We all went outside the farm buildings and just stood listening. And of course, thinking of people back home. All I'd heard for two months in the trenches was the hissing, the cracking and the whining of bullets in flight, machine gun fire and distant German voices. But there was a dead silence that morning 
right across the land as far as you could see. We shouted, Merry Christmas, even though nobody really felt merry. The silence ended early in the afternoon, and the killing started again. It was a short piece in a terrible war. The acts that occurred on the lead up to, on the day and beyond Christmas Day of 1914, were never repeated on such a scale again during the war. British officers saw to it that this soft behaviour was squashed out of the ranks, and as the war drew on, soldiers grew less and less optimistic that they themselves might be able to put a stop to the violence and bloodshed brought upon them from the powers above. That's the story of the Christmas truce. Now, I hope you have a wonderful Christmas, full of happiness and spending time with your families. I'm going to be sitting watching television, eating lots of food, and being thankful for what I have. We owe them so much, and they gave so much. Merry Christmas, thank you for all the support, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.